Chapter One of the Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, by Giacomo Casanova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Memoirs of Jacques Casanova, Volume One, The Venetian Years, by Giacomo Casanova. Episode One: Childhood. Chapter One. The illegitimate son of Don Francisco Casanova was a native of Saragossa, the capital of Aragon, and in the year fourteen twenty eight, he carried off Donna Alla Palafax from a convent on the day after she had taken the veil. He was secretary to King Alfonso. He ran away with her to Rome, where, after one year of imprisonment, the Pope, Martin the Third, released Anna from her vows, and gave them the nuptial blessing at the insistence of Don Juan Casanova, Major Domo of the Vatican, and uncle of Don Jacob. All the children born from that marriage died in their infancy, with the exception of Don Juan, who, in 1475, married Donna Eleanor Albini, of whom he had a son, Marco Antonio. In 1481, Don Juan, having killed an officer of the King of Naples, was compelled to leave Rome, and escape to Como with his wife and his son. But, having left the city to seek his fortune, he died while travelling with Christopher Columbus in the year 1493. Marco Antonio became a noted poet of the school of Martial, and was secretary to Cardinal Pompeo Colonna. The satire against Giulio de' Medici which we found in his works, having made it necessary for him to leave Rome, he returned to Como, where he married a Bondia Rezonica, the same Giulio de' Medicis, having become Pope under the name of Clement the Seventh, pardoned him, and called him back to Rome with his wife. The city having been taken and ransacked by the imperialists in 1526, Marco Antonio died there from an attack of the plague, otherwise he would have died of misery, the soldiers of Charles V having taken all he possessed. Pierre Valerian speaks of him in his work, De Infelicitate Litatorium. Three months after his death, his wife gave birth to Jacques Casanova, who died in France at a great age, colonel in the army, commanded by Farnes, against Henry, King of Navarre, afterwards King of France. He had left in the city of Parma a son who married Teresa Conti, from whom he had Jacques, who in the year 1681 married Anna Rolli. Jacques had two sons, Jean-Baptiste and Gaetan Joseph Jacques. The eldest left Parma in 1712 and was never heard of. The other also went away in 1715, being only nineteen years old. This all I have found in my father's diary. From my mother's lips I have heard the following particulars. Gaetan Joseph Jacques left his family, madly in love with an actress named Fragoletta, who performed the chambermaids. In his poverty he determined to earn a living by making the most of his own person. At first he gave himself up to dancing, and five years afterwards became an actor making himself conspicuous by his conduct still more than by his talent. Whether from fickleness or from jealousy, he abandoned the Fragoletta and joined in Venice a troupe of comedians, then given performances at the St. Samuel Theatre. Opposite the house in which he had taken his lodging resided a shoemaker, by name Jerome Frafusi, with his wife Marzia and Zanetta, their only daughter a perfect beauty, sixteen years of age. The young actor fell in love with this girl, succeeded in gaining her affection, and in containing her consent to a runaway match. It was the only way to win her, for, being an actor, he never could have had Marzia's consent, still less Jerome's, as in their eyes a player was a most awful individual. The young lovers, provided with the necessary certificates and accompanied by two witnesses, presented themselves before the Patriarch of Venice, who performed over them the marriage ceremony. 
Marzia, Zanetta's mother, indulged in a good deal of exclamation, and her father died broken-hearted. I was born nine months afterwards, on the 2nd of April, 1725. The following April my mother left me under the care of her own mother, who had forgiven her as soon as she had heard that my father had promised never to compel her to appear on the stage. This is a promise which all actors make to the young girls they marry, and which they never fulfil, simply because their wives never care much about claiming from them the performance of it. Moreover, it turned out a very fortunate thing for my mother that she had studied for the stage, for nine years later, having been left a widow with six children, she could not have brought them up if it had not been for the resources she found in that profession. I was only one year old when my father left me to go to London, where he had an engagement. It was in that great city that my mother made her first appearance on the stage, and in that city likewise that she gave birth to my brother Francois, a celebrated painter of battles, now residing in Vienna, where he has followed his profession since 1783. Towards the end of the year 1728, my mother returned to Venice with her husband, and as she had become an actress, she continued her artistic life. In 1730 she was delivered of my brother Jean, who became director of the Academy of Painting in Dresden, and died there in 1795. And during the three following years she became the mother of two daughters, one of whom died at an early age, while the other married in Dresden, where she still lived in 1798. I had also a posthumous brother, who became a priest. He died in Rome fifteen years ago. Let us now come to the dawn of my existence, in the character of a thinking being. The organ of memory began to develop itself in me, at the beginning of August 1733. I had at that time reached the age of eight years and four months. Of what may have happened to me before that period, I have not the faintest recollection. This is the circumstance. I was standing in the corner of a room bending towards the wall, supporting my head, and my eyes fixed upon a stream of blood flowing from my nose to the ground. My grandmother Marzia, whose pet I was, came to me, bathed my face with cold water, and, unknown to everyone in the house, took me with her in a gondola as far as Muran, a thickly populated island only half a league distance from Venice. Alighting from the gondola, we entered a wretched hole, where we found an old woman sitting on a rickety bed, holding a black cat in her arms, with five or six more pairing around her. The two old cronies held together a long discourse of which, most likely, I was a subject. At the end of the dialogue, which was carried on in the patios of Forley, the witch, having received a silver ducat from my grandmother, opened a box, took me in her arms, placed me in the box, and locked me in it, telling me not to be frightened. A piece of advice which would certainly have had the contrary effect, if I had had any wits about me, but I was stupefied. I kept myself quiet in a corner of the box, holding a handkerchief to my nose because it was still bleeding, and otherwise very indifferent to the uproar going on outside. I could hear in turn laughter, weeping, singing, screams, shrieks, and knocking against the box, but for all that I cared for naught. At last I am taken out of the box, the blood stops flowing. The wonderful old witch, after lavishing caresses upon me, takes off my clothes, lays me on the bed, burns some drugs, gathers the smoke in a sheet which she wraps around me, pronounces incantations, takes the sheets off me, and gives me five sugar-plums of a very agreeable taste. Then she immediately rubs my temples and the nap of my neck, with an ointment exhaling a delightful perfume, and puts my clothes on me again. She told me that my hemorrhage would little by little leave me, provided I should never disclose to anyone what she had done to cure me, and she threatened me, on the other hand, with the loss of all my blood and with death, should I ever breathe a word concerning these mysteries. After having thus taught me my lesson, 
she informed me that a beautiful lady would pay me a visit during the following night, and that she would make me happy, on condition that I should have sufficient control over myself, never to mention to any one having received such a visit. Upon this we left and returned home. I fell asleep almost as soon as I was in bed, without giving a thought to the beautiful visitor I was to receive. But, waking up a few hours afterwards, I saw, or fancied I saw, coming down the chimney, a dazzling woman with immense hoops, splendidly attired, and wearing on her head a crown set with precious stones, which seemed to me sparkling with fire. With slow steps, but with a majestic and sweet countenance, she came forward and sat on my bed. Then, taking several small boxes from a pocket, she emptied their contents over my head, softly whispering a few words, and, after giving utterance to a long speech, not a single word of which I understood, she kissed me, and disappeared the same way she had came. I soon went again to sleep. The next morning my grandmother came to dress me, and the moment she was near my bed she cautioned me to be silent, threatening me with death if I dared to say anything respecting my night's adventures. This command, laid upon me by the only woman who had complete authority over me, and whose orders I was accustomed to obey blindly, caused me to remember the vision and to store it, with the seal of secrecy, in the innermost corner of my dawning memory. I had not, however, the slightest inclination to mention the circumstances to any one. In the first place, because I did not suppose it would interest anybody, and in the second, because I would not have known whom to make a confidant of. My disease had rendered me dull and retired. Everybody pitied me, and left me to myself. My life was considerably likely to be but a short one, and as to my parents, they never spoke to me. After the journey to Moran, and the nocturnal visit of the fairy, I continued to have bleeding at the nose, but less from day to day, and my memory slowly developed itself. I learned to read in less than a month. It would be ridiculous, of course, to attribute this cure to such follies, but at the same time I think it would be wrong to assert that they did not in any way contribute to it. As far as the apparition of the beautiful queen is concerned, I have always deemed it to be a dream, unless it should have been some masquerade got up for the occasion. But it is not always in the druggist shops that are found the best remedies for severe diseases. Our ignorance is every day proved by some wonderful phenomenon, and I believe this to be the reason why it is so difficult to meet with a learned man entirely untainted with superstition. We know, as a matter of course, that there never have been any sorcerers in this world. Yet it is true that their power has always existed in the estimation of those to whom crafty knaves have passed themselves off as such. Somnio nocturnos lemues hortentacue thessalia vides. Many things became real which, at first, had no existence but in our imagination and, as a natural consequence, many facts which have been attributed to faith may not always have been miraculous, although they are true miracles for those who lend to faith a boundless power. The next circumstance of any importance to myself, which I recollect, happened three months after my trip to Muran, and six weeks before my father's death. I give it to my readers only to convey some idea of the manner in which my nature was expanding. One day, about the middle of November, I was with my brother Francois, two years younger than I, in my father's room, watching him attentively as he was working at optics. A huge lump of crystal, round and cut into facets, attracted my attention. I took it up, and having brought it near my eye, I was delighted to see that it multiplied objects. The wish to possess myself of it at once got hold of me, and, seeing myself unobserved, I took my opportunity, and hid it in my pocket. A few minutes after this my father looked about for his crystal, and, unable to find it, he concluded that one of us must have taken it. My brother asserted that he had not touched it, 
and I, although guilty, said the same. But my father, satisfied that he could not be mistaken, threatened to search us, and to thrash the one who had told him a story. I pretended to look for the crystal in every corner of the room, and, watching my opportunity, I slyly slipped it into the pocket of my brother's jacket. At first I was sorry for what I had done, for I might as well have feigned to find the crystal somewhere about the room. But the evil deed was past recall. My father, seeing that we were looking in vain, lost patience, searched us, found the unlucky ball of crystal in the pocket of the innocent boy, and inflicted upon him the promised thrashing. Three or four years later I was foolish enough to boast before my brother of the trick I had then played on him. He never forgave me, and has never failed to take his revenge whenever the opportunity offered. However, having at a later period gone to confession, and accused myself to the priest of the sin with every circumstance surrounding it, I gained some knowledge which afforded me great satisfaction. My confessor, who was a Jesuit, told me that by the deed I had verified the meaning of my first name, Jacques, which he said meant in Hebrew, supplanter, and that God had changed for that reason the name of the ancient patriarch into that of Israel, which meant knowing. He had deceived his brother Esau. Six weeks after the above adventure, my father was attacked with an abscess in the head, which carried him off in a week. Dr. Zambili first gave him operative remedies, and, seeing his mistake, he tried to mend it by administrating castorium, which sent his patient into convulsions and killed him. The abscess broke out through the ear one minute after his death, taking its leave after killing him, as if it had no longer any business with him. My father departed this life in the very prime of his manhood. He was only thirty-six years of age, but he was followed to his grave by the regrets of the public, and, more particularly, of all the patricians amongst them, whom he was held as above his profession, not less on account of his gentleman behaviour, than on account of his extensive knowledge in mechanics. Two days before his death, feeling that his end was at hand, my father expressed a wish to see us all around his bed, in the presence of his wife, and of the Messieurs Gramini, three Venetian noblemen, whose protection he wished to entreat in our favour. After giving us his blessing, he requested our mother, who was drowned in tears, to give her sacred promise that she would not educate any of us for the stage, on which he never would have appeared himself, had he not been led to it by an unfortunate attachment. My mother gave her promise, and the three noblemen said they would see to its being faithfully kept. Circumstances helped our mother to fulfil her word. At that time my mother had been pregnant for six months, and she was allowed to remain away from the stage until after Easter. Beautiful and young as she was, she declined all the offers of marriage which were made to her, and, placing her trust in Providence, she courageously devoted herself to the task of bringing up her young family. She considered it a duty to think of me before the others, not so much from a feeling of preference, as in consequence of my disease, which had such an effect upon me that it was difficult to know what to do with me. I was very weak, without any appetite, unable to apply myself to anything, and I had all the appearance of an idiot. Physicians disagreed as to the cause of the disease. He loses, they would say, two pounds of blood every week, yet there cannot be more than sixteen or eighteen pounds in his body. What, then, can cause so abundant a bleeding? One assented that in me all the chyle turned into blood. Another was of the opinion that the air I was breathing must, at each inhalation, increase the quantity of blood in my lungs, and contended that this was the reason for which I always kept my mouth open. I heard of it all six years afterward, from M. Baffo, a great friend of my late father. This M. Baffo consulted with the celebrated Dr. Markop of Padua, who sent him his opinion by writing. 
This consultation, which I still have in my possession, says that our blood is an elastic fluid, which is liable to diminish or to increase in thickness, but never in quantity, and that my hemorrhage could only proceed from the thickness of the mass of my blood, which relieved itself in a natural way in order to facilitate circulation. The doctor added that I would have died long before, had not nature, in its wish for life, asserted itself, and he concluded by stating that the cause of the thickness of my blood could only be ascribed to the air I was breathing, and that, consequently, I must have a change of air, or every hope of cure be abandoned. He thought, likewise, that the stupidity so apparent on my countenance was caused by nothing else but the thickness of my blood. M. Baffo, a man of sublime genius, a most lascivious, yet a great and original poet, was therefore instrumental in bringing about the decision which was then taken to send me to Padua, and to him I am indebted for my life. He died twenty years after, the last of an ancient patrician family, but his poems, although obscene, will give everlasting fame to his name. The state inquisitors of Venice have contributed to his celebrity by their mistaken strictness. Their persecutions caused his manuscript works to become precious. They ought to have been aware that despised things are forgotten. As soon as the verdict given by Professor Macop had been approved of, the Herb Grimani undertook to find me a good boarding-house in Padua for me, through a chemist of his acquaintance who resided in that city. His name was Ottaviani, and he was an antiquarian of some repute. In a few days the boarding-house was found, and on the second day of April, 1734, on the very day I had accomplished my ninth year, I was taken to Padua, in a borsiello along the Brenta Canal. We embarked at ten o'clock in the evening, immediately after supper. The borsiello may be considered a small floating-house. There is a large saloon with a smaller cabin at each end, and rooms for servants fore and aft. It is a long square with a roof, and cut on each side by glazed windows with shutters. The voyage takes eight hours. M. Grimani, M. Bafu, and my mother accompanied me. I slept with her in the saloon, and the two friends passed the night in one of the cabins. My mother rose at daybreak, opened one of the windows facing the bed, and the rays of the rising sun falling on my eyes caused me to open them. The bed was too low for me to see the land. I could see through the window only the tops of the trees along the river. The boat was sailing with such an even movement that I could not realize the fact of our moving, so that the trees which, one after the other, were rapidly disappearing from my sight, caused me an extreme surprise. "'Ah, dear mother!' I exclaimed. "'What is this? The trees are walking?' At that very moment the two noblemen came in, and, reading astonishment in my countenance, they asked me what my thoughts were so busy about. "'How is it?' I answered. "'That the trees are walking?' They all laughed. But my mother, heaving a great sigh, told me in a tone of deep pity— the boat is moving, the trees are not. Now dress yourself. I understood at once the reason of the phenomenon. Then it may be, said I, that the sun does not move, and that we, on the contrary, are resolving from west to east. At these words my good mother fairly screamed. M. Grimani pitied my foolishness and I remained dismayed, grieved, and ready to cry. M. Baffo brought me life again. He rushed to me, embraced me tenderly, and said, "'Thou art right, my child. The sun does not move. Take courage, give heed to your reasoning powers, and let others laugh.' My mother, greatly surprised, asked him whether he had taken leave of his senses to give me such lessons. But the philosopher, not even condescending to answer her, went on sketching a theory in harmony with my young and simple intelligence. This was the first real pleasure I enjoyed in my life. Had it not been for M. Baffo, 
this circumstance might have been enough to degrade my understanding. The weakness of credulity would have become part of my mind. The ignorance of the two others would certainly have blunted in me the edge of a faculty which, perhaps has not carried me very far in my after-life, but to which alone I feel that I am indebted for every particle of happiness I enjoy when I look into myself. We reached Padua at an early hour, and went to Ottaviani's house. His wife loaded me with caresses. I found there five or six children, amongst them a girl of eight years named Marie, and another of seven, Rose, beautiful as a seraph. Ten years later, Marie became the wife of the broker Colonda, and Rose, a few years afterwards, married a nobleman, Pierre Marcello, and had one son and two daughters, one of whom was wedded to M. Pierre Monasenigo, and the other to a nobleman of the Carrero family. This last marriage was afterwards nullified. I shall have, in the course of events, to speak of all these persons, and that is my reason for mentioning their names here. Ottaviani took us at once to the house where I was to board. It was only a few yards from his own residence, at Saint Marie de Vence, in the parish of Saint Michel, in the house of an old Sclavonian woman, who let the first floor to Signora Mida, wife of a Sclavonian colonel. My small trunk was laid open before the old woman, to whom was handed an inventory of all its contents, together with six sequins for six months paid in advance. From this small sum she undertook to feed me, to keep me clean, and to send me to a day-school. Protesting that it was not enough, she accepted these terms. I was kissed and strongly commanded to be always obedient and docile, and I was left with her. In this way did my family get rid of me. End of chapter 1